and we begin at five o'clock with the state of local schools amid the fight against COVID. In briefings today, Multnomah County health officials said they're trying to minimize the spread of the virus while still keeping kids in the classroom. It is a tough balancing act, and as Morgan Romero shows us, they're learning as they go. Across Multnomah County schools, thousands of staff and students sit at home in quarantine, including over 1,300 from Reynolds High School after four people tested positive. There isn't a huge outbreak, but because too many kids were out for potential exposure, administrators made the call to go online. Public health leaders say it shows how staffing shortages in schools and on buses make contact tracing a challenge. There may be more children excluded than who are truly exposed, and um, that's what we're trying to limit. Public health leaders talked about that and other COVID-related school issues with reporters and county commissioners Tuesday. We have taken our local data, we've taken national data, we've talked through def different scenarios and, and really gotten down to what do we recommend. Repeating often alongside school districts, they're still learning. You know, for the next six to eight weeks, there's a lot of deep learning that we're planning on doing to help um, mitigate the spread and again, keep kids in school. But this is the area that we're spending the most time on to really understand what's going on so that we can modify um, and support the schools. They stress the importance of seating charts and layered safety measures to scale back quarantines and keep kids in school. Even with the, the number of exposures that we've seen, we have seen very little evidence of any transmission happening within the schools. Although Multnomah County Health is looking into five schools where they think COVID spread, one layer in avoiding large quarantines, testing. But county leaders recognize it needs to be more accessible. We're looking at the balance. Testing is not the only pathway um, in terms of continuity of education and keeping kids at school. Public health officials say vaccines for young kids will be another pathway to keep kids in school, hopefully preventing another situation like Reynolds. So we can talk about closing a school for public health reasons, um, but that's not going to keep kids from mixing. And if anything, they're better off in school for the learning um, and in a structured environment where people are reminding them to wear their masks and to, and to stay apart. So, so that's part of uh, what we're struggling with. Morgan Romero, KGW News. Coquille Junior Senior High School in Coos County is being forced to shut down because of COVID cases. 15 people tested positive last week. That includes two coaches and eight players on the football team. The girls' soccer team and the volleyball team also have cases. All in-person classes, athletics, and extracurricular activities are being shut down at the school for at least three weeks. We didn't just make this decision on our own. We were making sure we were talking to Coos Health and Wellness and talking to our school nurses and making sure that we bring in a lot of different voices so that we were um, doing what was best for the overall good of the district and the students. Online learning is set to start tomorrow. The hope is to have students back by October 11th. Washington Governor Jay Inslee says the state's hospitals need more help and has sent a letter now to the White House COVID team asking for more staffing. The governor says COVID hospitalizations have doubled every two weeks over the summer. He's requesting 1,200 clinical and non-clinical staff through FEMA. However, there is a bit of positive news as recent data is showing hospitalizations appear to be coming down. Now that Pfizer has said its COVID vaccine is safe for kids as young as five, that's bringing up questions about consent. If a child wants to get their shot, but their parents don't want them to, what options do they have? Mark Hanrahan verifies. Let's start with the question. Can a minor get a non-emergency medical procedure like a vaccine without their parents' consent? My sources are Washington Law Help, a division of the Northwest Justice Project, Washington's largest publicly funded legal aid program, and Dan Orfort, the managing attorney for Team Child, a statewide nonprofit legal firm for juveniles in Washington. As a child, a minor in the state of Washington, do they need their parents' consent to get a vaccine, specifically the COVID vaccine? Yeah, so um, for all vaccines, generally the answer is yes, they need um, 
parent consent if they are under 18. There are, though, exceptions. Dan points to the mature minor rule, which was created as a result of a 1967 Washington Supreme Court case. It allows health care providers to treat minors as adults based on an assessment and documentation of their maturity. But providers must consider a variety of factors outlined in this document from Washington Law Help, including does the minor live apart from their parents or guardian, their age and maturity, and are they financially independent from their parents or guardians? But that is not uh, a whole lot of guidance. So um, as medical providers are um, being relied upon for a lot of things right now, um, it, it, it probably varies as to how confident medical providers are in making that determination uh, on their own. Dan says the mature minor rule is vague at best and lacks guidance for providers who must decide whether to treat a minor without their parents' consent. He says, though, there is a much more definitive route for teens seeking a procedure. If uh, a youth 16 or 17 years old uh, does really want to get a vaccine and doesn't have parental consent, they could petition to be legally emancipated in court. So we can verify that, yes, a minor can get vaccinated without their parents' consent if a provider determines they meet the requirements outlined in the mature minor rule or if a judge grants the request to be emancipated from their parents. The battle over redistricting in Oregon will continue for at least one more day, and not because of politics, but because of COVID. House Speaker Tina Kotek adjourned today's session before any vote could be cast, announcing someone who was in the Capitol yesterday had tested positive. The House will reconvene tomorrow morning to vote on redistricting maps. This after the 2020 census showed Oregon's population had grown so much that it needs a new sixth seat in Congress. The Democrats proposal has already passed the Senate. It would all but ensure the seat would be blue. House Republicans are mad because yesterday Speaker Kotek revoked her promise to let bipartisan committees lead the way on their vote. Kotek argued Republicans had been stalling the process and refusing to work together. Republicans say they've been tricked. The plan was, in fact, to get gerrymandered maps through this body no matter what. I know um, they are upset, um, but honestly, I have been upset with them since the census data came out. Lawmakers have until next Monday to get new maps finalized. If it doesn't happen, the Secretary of State will draw up state legislative districts. A committee of five judges will handle congressional districts. Police in Gresham are investigating a deadly shooting as a homicide. It happened last night in the parking lot of a Walmart on West Powell Boulevard near 182nd. Police say the victim is 38-year-old Deshaun Hudson of Portland. No word yet on any arrests or what led up to the shooting. Police are asking for any witnesses to contact them. A Portland woman is hoping a suspected thief is caught after he assaulted her. She says the attack happened because she told him to stay off her neighbor's porches. Anna Fisher says it happened on Sunday evening. She saw the man walking down Southeast 19th near Bybee. He was on a neighbor's porch with stuff in his arms. Fisher says she warned him several times to leave and that's when he attacked her. He dropped his stuff on uh, the yard and came across the street and got about eight feet away. And I said, you need to back off. Um, and he paused for a moment and just clocked me. I just want him caught. I don't want him to hurt anybody else. The man ran when police arrived. Police tell us they took an assault report, but haven't found or identified the suspect. They also collected evidence, including surveillance video and items that he dropped on the ground. Today, the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office announced that a deadly explosion in Troutdale was, quote, not criminal in any way. It happened early in the morning on Monday, September 13th. After firefighters put out the flames, they found a man dead in a burned car. Police have not released the cause of the explosion, but emphasize there is no danger to the public. In the days after the explosion, deputies also responded to another call for a potential explosive device in that area. But they say the two incidents are not related, and the second call was a false alarm. Portland city leaders are close to saying where some will where they will build some homeless safe rest villages and one of them could be a site that wasn't previously on the list of possibilities. That site is the Portland Expo Center. 
Talks are happening on the feasibility of an RV and car park for the homeless at the Expo Center. It's according to the city and Metro Regional Government, which owns it. Metro says the plan would have to include the Expo Center continuing its convention and events business while also hosting a parking lot village for those living in RVs and cars. The Expo Center is a 54 acre site, so there's a lot of space uh, uh, in various parts of the, of the facility um, that could be used to support this. But, you know, it's part of our commitment to try and be a part of the solution here. The city will announce three of six sites is planning by the end of the month. Most will accommodate tiny houses. We'll keep it posted on what they decide.